Happy Friday, and welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today as we look into a very perplexing mystery. This headline grabbed me, and I knew I just had to dive into it because I had to try to figure more out. First of all, the initial run of headlines on this case didn't even have the victim's name. And I was kind of worried because I've seen this happen with certain news articles where they won't name the victim and the details never get associated to the victim's name. And then all of a sudden that case just kind of disappears. Like you never really hear what happens in it. So I didn't want that to happen with this case because I have a feeling there's a chance this might be a criminal act. I think there's a, a fairly decent chance of it being a criminal act. If it's not a criminal act, there's also another very important discussion that needs to be had around this case. What is this headline that has grabbed me so strongly? Over at the New York Daily News, American Airlines flight attendant found dead at Philadelphia Hotel with sock stuffed in her mouth. What is going on with this case? Let's start by learning a little bit more about where this is happening. Philadelphia International Airport, it serves 9.8 million passengers annually and in 2021, making it the 21st busiest airport in the United States. It's located about seven miles from the city's downtown area, and it has 22 airlines that offer nearly 500 daily departures to more than 130 destinations worldwide. Philadelphia International Airport is the largest airport serving the state of Pennsylvania. It's the fifth largest hub for American Airlines. And obviously, we know that this flight attendant did work for American Airlines. Now, some large airports will have hotels that are occasionally um, built on the same property or adjacent properties that connect to those airports. And that is the case with the hotel that we're talking about here today, which is important for a specific consideration that we'll get to. But uh, we're talking about basically the Philadelphia Airport Marriott, and this is from their page, marriott.com. It's conveniently connected to Terminal B at Philly Airport. The hotel is near Lincoln Financial Field, home of the Eagles, and close to downtown attractions like the Liberty Bell and Rittenhouse Square. So imagine you've got this hotel that's kind of attached to the airport. We know we're talking about a flight crew that had a layover, um, they went and stayed in that hotel. Something happens in that hotel and one of those flight crew members doesn't make their flight back home. I know a lot of you out there are aware of how much security is at airports. We've got the TSA. Sometimes they'll have their own airport police units. Uh, we've got a hotel, the Marriott. They're likely to have CCTV camera all over the common areas. So what exactly could happen in that type of situation? Well, we're talking about what could happen in a hotel room. You're not going to have CCTV cameras in the hotel room. You might have them in the hallway. So if this is a situation where someone went back with a flight attendant into her room, there's probably footage of that person. Is that the type of situation we're talking about here? Can we find more details to try to make sense out of this? Let's continue it's over at NBCPhiladelphia.com. Officials are investigating after a 66-year-old woman was found dead in a room at the Philadelphia Airport Marriott on Monday night. This would have been Monday, September 25th. According to Philadelphia Police Chief Inspector Scott Small, officers were called to the Philadelphia Airport Marriott at 1 Arrival Road at about 10.41 p.m. on Monday after the body of a 66-year-old woman was discovered in a hotel room. The woman was pronounced dead at the scene at about 10.45 p.m., and when she was discovered, she had a cloth in her mouth. Now, I do just want to point out about half the articles that I've run into are saying that there was some form of cloth in her mouth. Uh, the other half is being very plain that it is a sock. And then there's even a very small number of articles that they're seeming to suggest it could have been a rag or something else like that. Um, based on the news sources that I'm seeing, I believe that the assessment of, of it being a sock is actually a fair assessment. It's coming up in all of the uh, kind of major news sources that we usually trust here. And uh, kind of sounds familiar actually might tie to a case that we covered several years ago. We'll touch on that by the end of today's episode. But um, Small told NBC10 that officials are investigating the incident as a suspicious death, though he said that 
she did suffer a sudden death and there were no signs of forced entry into the hotel room. Also, she was on several medications, according to Small. Um, interesting, there's no signs of forced entry, but that could just mean that she was invited into the room. Someone went back to her room with her. Possibly someone had access to her room in some other way. And it's also interesting to me that they're calling out that it's a suspicious death right off the bat. Um, but we're not necessarily hearing of any signs of struggle. We're also not hearing them say, no, there's no signs of a struggle. They're just saying no forced entry, at least as, as of these early reports. Um, more information will kind of trickle out. But to be honest with you guys, there's not, not a ton of information available in this case. We do have a few photos of them removing her uh, from the room. We've got the police van driving off to get the autopsy started. Over at Fox News, Philadelphia authorities ID American Airlines flight attendant found dead in hotel room. Her name is Diana Ramos. Prior to Ramos being identified as the deceased, American Airlines issued a statement saying it was devastated by the news. Our thoughts are with the family and colleagues, and we're doing everything we can to ensure all affected have the support they need during this difficult time, the airline said. We will continue to cooperate fully with local law enforcement in their investigation. A flight attendant for the airline told Fox News Digital they spoke to Ramos's flight crew, which said that she was supposed to be the lead flight attendant for a flight from Philadelphia to Los Angeles. From what I understand, her flight crew is actually based out of L.A., the crew is saying that they were staying at a hotel located inside of the Philadelphia airport, said the flight attendant, who wished to remain anonymous. I think there's been two anonymous flight attendants that have been commenting on this. Um, back to their quote, they didn't meet in the lobby for pickup as they normally would due to the hotel being located in the airport. No van shuttle being needed. So... That doesn't seem so odd. It seems kind of reasonable. You know, if this is a flight crew that had to stay at a hotel that was off site, sure, they might want to meet up in the morning because they're going to have to grab a shuttle together or, you know, grab a taxi together. Some, some form of transportation is going to be needed. And to coordinate that together with the people that you're working with probably makes sense. In this case, we've got the hotel being attached directly to the airport. It's a matter of Instead of, well, I'll meet you in the lobby of the hotel. Hey, I'll meet you at the gate because we're already at the airport. So it seems kind of reasonable. I can tell you that in terms of the social media around this case, uh, there's a lot of eyes looking at that flight crew saying, why, why did you leave her behind like this? And there's, there's some pretty big questions that come out in some of that uh, criticism and analysis as well. Let's get back to the article here. Authorities have not determined what caused Ramos's death or whether anyone was involved. Her body was taken to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. The results are pending. The Marriott has been and is cooperating with the police in all of this as well. Who is Diana Ramos? Diana Ramos was a highly knowledgeable and well-liked flight attendant who committed more than 25 years of her time helping passengers of American Airlines. She was renowned for her excellence in her area and her commitment to providing exceptional customer service was widely praised. On top of that, I did find her Facebook page, uh, a page, it doesn't look like she used it a ton. We can see her last post is from this year. It's from September 10th, just a few weeks before this event. And it's just reminding everyone to not forget about September 11th. Um, of course, someone working in that industry, I'm sure that, I mean, for anyone living in this country, September 11th has a place in all of our hearts. But for anyone that works on an airline, I think it it means even more to them because of um, what happened on, on that terrible day. But just kind of doing a quick scan through her Facebook, it's, uh, you know, a bunch of good causes, basically. This is someone trying to raise attention, um, trying to help raise money on a GoFundMe, um, you know, sharing information about a veteran's crisis line, a few photos of her uh, and her family. And it seems like she really has uh, love for a little dog of hers. I can't find any references to her dog's name, but I do know that it is a girl dog. I know it's a female that she has. Let's just do a quick jump into the photo so I can show you a picture. We can see one even here. 
where uh, a friend of Diana is saying she probably hates it when you leave. And you can see that her dog is actually getting into her luggage there like, like she wants to come along. Uh, a little more information that I was able to find here. In 1957, Diana Ramos was born to her parents in Texas. She grew up in Houston where she attended C.E. King High School. In 1975, she completed schooling and joined Houston Community College where she earned her bachelor's in 1979. Uh, another thing I did notice on her Facebook page, this is someone that really seemed to love her work and love the aspect of travel. Um, even though she didn't use her Facebook a whole lot, when she did, it would frequently be, hey, look, I'm in Cancun. Hey, look, I'm in Hawaii. This is someone that kind of enjoyed the benefits of working for an airline and being able to visit different places around the world. Diana Ramos was married to Raymond Ramos, a man that she met in her college days. They raised a daughter together. Now, here they're saying that the daughter's name is Delaney Taylor. Um, I did find a Facebook reference to her daughter. Uh, in this case, her daughter's name is Eva Mice. And Eva has this post from October 5th. I know some of you are aware, but for those who do not, my mother tragically died September 25th there is an open investigation. My family and I have no answers, only questions. I was hoping to at least have funeral arrangements to share by today, but I don't. We are all saddened by this situation. Personally, my heart hurts and I'm devastated. I'm thankful for all the support from family and friends. Uh, and it's terrible to think that they haven't been able to share funeral arrangements and here we are a week later and this is the most recent update from Eva. So I, I think they still haven't been able to share funeral arrangements and that just makes me wonder about what is going on with this autopsy process, even if they were waiting on toxicology, which I think might be a possibility here. We did hear that note in one of the early articles that some medication was found in her room. Um, even if they are waiting on toxicology, all those samples would have been taken already, and those are going to be sent off to a lab to be worked on. I don't know why uh, her remains wouldn't be turned over to the family so they could go ahead and um, have their memorial service. I'm not sure what the delay is there. And it's just got me concerned about, is there more that's going on with her? Was there signs of struggle of some kind or some type of analysis that has to happen um, with her body still? It's just another question in this seemingly unending chain of questions. Uh, of course, Eva is also um, referring to a GoFundMe. We'll talk a bit more about that later, but some photos from the GoFundMe here show Diana. I'm not sure if this is her husband or not. Uh, it might be, but we do see Diana with the dog that she loves so much. Um, we've got her at uh, in Ecuador at the equator, it looks like. And another shot of her at Ice Bar. I believe this is the Ice Bar in Las Vegas. Um, based on her Facebook information, it looks like uh, her home is actually in Nevada. So even though she's based out of Los Angeles for her work, uh, she does live in the Nevada area, at least according to you know the most recent updates. Like I said, she, was, she wasn't using her Facebook page a whole lot, but uh, Paradise, Nevada is what is listed as her home city. What else can we learn about this? Let's head over to the sun. A cleaning crew made the horrific discovery. So that was one question I had looking at this originally. How was she found? How did this all come out? Also, there's a question about timing. Um, how long was she in that room before she was discovered? When I was seeing the articles initially, I just made the assumption that, oh, she didn't show up for her shift later that day, you know, cleaning might have gone into her room and and found her something along those lines a very quick kind of discovery not actually the case uh they found the body of the american airlines flight attendant after she failed to check out two days earlier so that is also raising some questions for people no weapons were recovered from the hotel room uh small said that ramos was on several medications at the time of her death you know, she's 66 years old. I, I don't think that's going to be unheard of. Uh, it is noting here that sealed bottles of prescription drugs were reportedly found in the room. 
I don't know why they're phrasing it as sealed. I guess they're trying to just make the clarification that, you know, they were closed. The tops weren't popped off of them. Um, and it is kind of an important statement. I mean, if we are imagining some type of situation where maybe for some reason she didn't want to live any longer, um, knowing that the bottles of prescription medications were closed and had their tops on them is a bit of a different scene than thinking of, you know, police walk into this scene. They see that there's prescription drug medication. The bottle tops are off. The bottles are empty. Things are thrown around the room. Like that's just not the type of description we're getting. We're, we're not getting a lot of description. I just want to be really, really clear about that. But I think little pieces like that are important. Uh, sealed bottles of prescription drugs reportedly found in the room. We know she worked for American Airlines for 25 years, and she was staying at the hotel on a layover after working on a flight from Los Angeles. We have another quote here from one of these unnamed co-workers. Everybody's still trying to figure out what happened and why her crew just left her. A lot of moving parts and questions right now. Very sad. So... I think even without that type of comment, you're going to have people in the social media space kind of start looking at this aspect of it. You know, is it, is it normal? Is it strange? I've never worked as a flight attendant. I I've never been on a flight crew. I can't tell you guys what form of camaraderie happens with that. Um, do they really, you know, keep an eye out for each other, things of that nature. We do have other people that are making comments on that. I'm going to try to weave some of that in. Remember some of this stuff, um, is coming from people that work in that industry. And some of it is also opinion. So it's kind of a mishmash here, but, uh, let's see over at the sun, people are now pointing fingers at Ramos's coworkers for not reporting her missing several airline workers in the public Facebook group, a fly guys cabin crew lounge have commented. The post included a picture of Ramos wearing her airline uniform and the caption, the global airline community has voiced concerns and frustration over American Airlines' failure to perform a welfare check on Ramos after she was reported missing by her colleagues at the airport. Airlines have a duty of care for their staff and are responsible for following up on situations when crew members fail to report for their flights away from their bases. It seems reasonable to me. And just thinking about, you know, I have worked in some places where travel would be a part of it. Um, and even though you're not effectively working for 24 hours that day, you know, you get back to your hotel, you can go, go kind of do what you want. There was always this kind of keeping tabs on each other, keeping in check with each other. Hey, where are you going to be tomorrow? You know, I imagine in this type of work, where they're literally hopping from place to place to place at that level of camaraderie is probably going to be a little bit stronger than even the type of stuff that, that I'm talking about, just the general kind of watching out for, for your coworker here. Um, I would like to think that beyond that, maybe there's some formal, or maybe it's more of an etiquette issue, but some type of expected, Hey, we're a crew, we're going to watch out for each other. And this is what we're going to do for that to happen on the flip side of that. We're talking about airlines. We're talking about things that run on very strict schedules. So if someone doesn't show up, is it reasonable for like, you know, the captain's not going to hang back and say, Hey, I don't know where my flight attendant is. So we're delaying this flight. I mean, that's just, that's not going to happen. Is there some type of mechanism in there where the captain or some other chief crew member relays the information to someone at the airlines and all of a sudden it puts them on task about, Hey, follow up on this because we don't know where this crew member went and that kind of kicks off some process, some means of update. I'm wondering about that because we're talking about a case where she's missing for two days and where is she ultimately found in the same room where you would have expected her to be two days before. So how did that happen exactly? It is a troubling question in, in this whole thing. And especially considering that it's, it's a hotel, it's, it's property owned by someone else. You know, the, the hotel, shouldn't they have checked? Wouldn't they have checked? Um, for some reason, we get this two-day gap on this that is tough. It's really hard to understand. But outside of that, you know, we've got social media kind of looking at this in terms of, hey, being a crew member, how do we support each other? Do we watch out for each other or not? 
And back to the comment from this post at a Fly Guys cabin crew lounge, no crew member should be left behind. The airline must do better. A different airline worker commented, as a crew member, if someone did not show up for pickup, we called their room. If there was no answer, security was brought in to check their room. Another person wrote, I can't imagine not checking on my crew if they failed to show up at our agreed time. Third person wrote, something ain't right. The captain would have sent the number one to go check on her. Unless the cockpit left the hotel separately, then it would be up to the number one when the crew met in the lobby. So that third person, I think, is kind of alluding to more of what I'm talking about. There would be some form of process about, hey, we don't know where she is. I'm I'm delegating this to you. Go figure that out. Or, you know, tell the front desk that we don't know where our stewardess is. This is where she was last known. Maybe relay the information about the hotel, which I'm sure they already know because I'm pretty sure the airline it, the airline's making the accommodations for that night. She's not paying for that, obviously. She's on a layover for work. Another crew member shared insight on how their crew members handle air travel. Quote, our airline policy is we arrived together, we leave together. Sounds like a good policy. Clearly not exactly what happened in this case. Over at themessenger.com, a little more information. So they did actually try to call. We do have a note here that the crew tried to call, at least it's weird because, and I'm not trying to be funny, but in this, there's a little bit of a game of telephone. It's like someone, oh, I think someone else tried to call. Uh, one of the anonymous flight attendants speaking to Fox News said, upon reaching their gate and realizing that one of the flight attendants wasn't at the gate, the crew notified the gate agents they were missing a crew member. And one of the crew members said that as far as they know, another crew member tried to call the hotel twice to get them to check on the missing crew member. Um, once again, we're not dealing with all the details here, but I would like to think that this type of crew that's working together probably has each other's cell phone. I would imagine someone at least shot off a text message. Hey, where are you? We're getting ready to go. Uh, maybe there was no response to that. Uh, here we do at least get that, you know, they did talk to the gate agents. So now we do have the company kind of being more aware. And if there is some process around this, that should be engaged at that point still has me wondering about it because of the two-day gap. I just, I can't shake that. Um, but also we get this, like I said, a game of telephone. Uh, as far as I know, another crew member tried to call the hotel twice to get them to check on the missing crew member, which in some cases for some people might be actually kind of shifting the accountability here. I mean, if that person did actually call the hotel and said, hey, we've got a crew member missing, can you go check her room? Why are we not finding her until two days later? On Facebook, an American Airlines employee said the crew proceeded with boarding despite Ramos being unaccounted for at the time of the flight because they had met the exact minimum amount of staff needed for takeoff. Quote, I think that they thought she might have gone over early to get food, the employee wrote in a comment on a now deleted post. However, when it was time to board passengers, they still had exactly minimum crew on, so companies started boarding them and they departed on time. The crew attempted calling her two times, I think by calling hotel, no answer, the plane departed. Interesting to me that that was a comment that has since been removed. But on social media, many current and former flight attendants speculated about why it took so long to find Ramos and why the crew may not have shown urgency in locating her. One commenter, former flight attendant Yaroslava Potosina, speculated that it may be challenging to maintain concern for crew members while working for a large airline where thousands of employees may not have close personal connections. Uh, she wrote that a crew member late means no show, replacement, and fly off, she said. Unfortunately, this is the truth about, about airlines. And like I said, I can understand that there's a strict schedule. They're going to hold that schedule. According to some of the other stuff that I've bumped into, other comments on this, they're saying that there are even flight attendants that are just basically waiting at the airport. They don't have a specific assignment and they're waiting for situations like this. If you have someone get sick or something, how do you handle that? Um, so there is a mechanism for, and there is an expectation that, hey, you might miss a flight occasionally. Um, you would like to think that, that if, if, if that is the case, that you've got these other systems at play, especially 
when we're talking about security just in the modern day and age like you know we how many different cases do we look into about strange occurrences and things that happen in hotels and things of that nature and then you've got this kind of roaming team that is jumping all over the country or even sometimes the world um yeah i just i'd, I'd like to think that there's some system in place here i'm just i'm still not 100 percent sure after going through all this so like I kind of touched on in that last article, now people starting to redirect their attention a little bit. We have a commenter here, JS42, saying something fishy here. What hotel doesn't check a room for two days after the guest was supposed to check out, especially when there were calls to ask them to check on the occupant? That is a really good question. Um, I, I honestly can't answer it. I can't imagine them just not going into the room it's not like the you know do not disturb card on the front door is going to stop them from going into the room the day after the reservation is up the room isn't rented anymore like why why is it taking them two days it's a great question uh the mr doug responded to that rooms that are showing as due to be checked out are always checked by housekeeping only way to confirm checked out that's a good point as well uh, i know in many hotels that i go to I don't really process the checkout. I leave my keys in the room and they come in, they, they see that I've left, they take my keys and that's how my, my checkout gets processed. Um, so Mr. Doug pointing that out. System is then updated. 100% would check on a room if got an ask, call, leave message, no response, go check. So much is not adding up. Mr. Doug says going to be a hotel employee, but we have to keep in mind here. We're not sure that there is any form of criminal action that's really going on with this as of yet. We just, we don't have enough information to make that determination at people.com sister-in-law of American airlines flight attendant found dead is shocked. I'm shocked that something like this could have happened to her, said Helen Alanis, sister of Ram Ramos's late husband, Raymond Ramos. It's just unbelievable because she seems sweet. Alanis said her brother Raymond and Diana kept to themselves for the most part, but lived in the same state as Alanis. They pretty much kept to themselves because of her schedule and flying. She wasn't always available. Ever since my brother passed, after that, we never got any word from her, she said. I would call her phone number and leave her a message because I wanted to hear about what she was going to do. Was she going to stay locally or move somewhere else? I just don't have any idea how that could have happened to her. She also adds that it's especially tough that this happened in September because September is the same month that her brother, uh, as well as both of her parents and now her former sister-in-law have all passed away in that month. And that does lead to a bit of a thought here. Um, he, her husband, Raymond, had died two years prior. Um, is there something about that being a difficult month? We're hearing from his sister, it's a difficult month for her. Would it be a difficult month for Raymond's widowed wife? Of course. Uh, is that potentially a component here? Are we looking at a situation that might involve some form of self-harm? Um, I think, I think it's possible. That's when we're looking at this type of situation, I, I really, my mind is split in three different directions. We're either looking at some form of an attack, which I have found some instances of, I can tell you specifically for a sock being used to harm someone in most situations, unfortunately, I'm seeing it with children being used against children. Um, there are a few issues in terms of self-harm that come up with this as well, where a sock is used as an item in that act. Um, there's also something that I bumped into, I wish I hadn't, but basically a variation in, in terms of a form of torture. And I'm not even gonna go into it more than that. Um, but I did find some examples that make me kind of think twice about this. I really don't know which way to go. Uh, over at eastcountymagazine.org, jail inmate ended his own life by choking on sock, 
Don Ralph, 52 years old, was found unresponsive by deputies doing a security check at the San Diego Central Jail. Deputies found a sock lodged in his throat. They removed it and they performed first aid until they were relieved by paramedics. But despite their life-saving efforts, Ralph was declared dead a half hour later. Interesting in that story, he did actually share his cell with another inmate. However, the sheriff's department concluded there was no preliminary evidence of foul play. And even if we are talking about a situation like that where you're trying to evaluate as foul play a consideration, thinking of the physicality of an attack like that, what would it be? Like, is someone going to stuff something in your mouth and then keep your arms pinned down to stop you from retrieving it? Wouldn't that leave some form of bruising, possibly on your wrists or some other marks to show the struggle? Um, wouldn't the person be scratching, biting, clawing, doing anything to get out of that situation? I would think there would be some type of physical evidence that would suggest uh, the struggle. And at least I don't, I don't know about this case for Don Ralph in particular, um, but for Diana's case with what we're hearing so far, we're not hearing anything about signs of a physical struggle. We've got one kind of important detail I haven't shared with you guys yet that is just keeping this needle right in the middle for me. But let's get back to a few more of these other examples. Um, continuing with this article, suffocation with a sock is not unheard of. In 2015, a Mexican immigrant reportedly also ended his life in an ICE detention facility by using a sock. Um, a British high school student uh, a British, a British student, sorry, that was high on drugs found to have killed himself in the same manner. In that instance, there was a fetish component that was kind of involved with it. And I have seen a few examples of that, that using socks as a fetish item has led to, and that's kind of in terms of the three aspects, you know, someone doing this, possibly the person doing this to themselves or some type of accident is really the third aspect. And I did find a few examples of that as well. I kind of think the British student example might fall fall into that. Uh, one other here, in 2018, a Rikers Island inmate um, also died when a, a sock was stuffed into his throat, but that was ruled that he had done that to himself. A 1984 Veterans Administration patient death also was ruled to have been done by himself. However, the family later came to suspect that he was actually murdered after new evidence revealed that a fellow veteran had been overheard by a staffer literally threatening to stuff a sock down the patient's throat and kill him if he snored again. And it seems like that's how he died. So at least in that case, it seems like the family suspects that maybe that person actually did follow through on that threat in some way. And of course, I mentioned this is starting to sound a little bit familiar. A few years ago, we covered the case of Alan Geel. And in that case, body was found with a sock in the mouth on the beach. The body of Alan Geel, he was 64. It was found in 2014. The coroner said it's not possible to exclude intentional death, accidental death, or the involvement of a third party. Once again, basically those, those three areas that it could possibly be. Um, there was alcohol found in his system, but no drugs. They had CCTV footage of him. They were able to trace his movements pretty strongly uh, leading up to him going to a bar, I believe, if I recall correctly, and then being found in the water. Coast Guard said they believe Mr. Geel had entered the water to the north of the spot where he was found. A backpack was later found along with a rain jacket and his other shoe. One of his shoes was found with him. Uh, they had an inquest on this case. A pathologist told the inquest that Mr. Jill had sustained significant injuries while he was still alive. Some of those injuries were consistent with a fall from a height. So, of course, leaving both avenues open. Someone else did this to him. Possibly he was attacked. Maybe he was thrown off a ledge or something like that. Or maybe he wasn't attacked. Maybe he threw himself. Dr. Jeffrey said that she had no idea why the sock was in his mouth, saying, it's not something I've come across before. It's most unusual and causes a degree of concern. And that's from an expert. And that's part of the reason I think why this story, why Diana's story is grabbing us in the way that it is. It's not a super common thing, even though I was able to find 
several cases. It's a handful of cases that I was able to find. And pretty much we've touched on all of them as of me talking to you guys about Alan Geel now. There's just, there's not a ton of cases um, where this aspect comes into play. Somehow a sock is um, either partially responsible or possibly completely responsible for the death. She said, Mr. Geel died partially as a result of head and chest injuries, as well as the drowning process. The sock in his mouth didn't match the socks that he was wearing, but it did potentially match some socks that were found at his home. One other thing that Dr. Jeffrey noted that I wanted to share with you guys here is it is clear the sock was purposefully stuffed in his mouth. It would be a rather unusual thing to do to oneself. I'm not aware of this being a recommended practice for taking your own life. Um, and I could find no references to anything like that. You know, there's some very dark websites out there that talk about very dark things. I couldn't find references to that specifically either. Uh, back to her, her quote, it is possible the headphones were inadvertently dragged into the mouth at the same time that the sock was inserted. So in Alan's case, it wasn't just the sock, but uh, if I remember right, it was earbuds also that were found in his mouth and in his throat. So what Dr. Jeffrey here is saying that perhaps that sock was inserted in a hurried manner. Could that have been, there was some kind of struggle. There was some kind of fight going on. Someone reached, grabbed for a sock, accidentally grabbed the earbuds at the same time, jammed it in his mouth, possibly. Or maybe Alan, in, for some reason, had a hurried manner when he was grabbing the sock. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's just an interesting twist because having that extra item does really suggest that there's almost like a little bit of a lack of control in the situation or something that's, it's already odd to have the sock, but to have the earbuds with the sock just kind of kicks it up another notch. Regardless, this brings it all back to Diana. What is going on in this case? Why we, everything that I've told you guys is all that's available right now. I kept looking. I was hoping that we were going to get some updated information on the autopsy. We don't have that yet. We are literally stuck with the three buckets. And honestly, I don't know how much the fetish idea, accidental theory really fits into this at all. Um, it doesn't seem like it. We've got the police that are on the scene that are saying, Hey, look, this, this looks suspicious right off the rip. As a matter of fact, that one little fact that I've kind of been holding off on you guys, uh, law officials remain silent on whether or not the sock was deep enough to prevent her from breathing as well as why it took two days for her death to be found. The results of the autopsy were still waiting for them. Her death is being actively investigated by the homicide detectives division of Philadelphia police department due to the circumstances and the case is being handled as suspicious. Homicide detectives are on this. It's leading me to believe that this isn't your typical death investigation. Um, I believe that that is an indicator. Maybe there were some other things in the room that didn't look right to them. And they've handed this off to the homicide detectives division. Now, to be fair, I don't know about Philadelphia police department in particular. Sometimes death investigations might be consolidated by one department and everything just kind of gets funneled to them. In the previous examples I've seen of that, I don't think those divisions are usually labeled as homicide. Um, but we've got them saying this case looks suspicious right off the get-go and we have a homicide detectives division that's working it at this point. So it's kind of keeping me in that middle zone of, I just don't know. I don't know what's going on with it. Web Sleuths has been commenting on the case, uh, just a few pages worth of comments now, but as always, really, really good conversation happening over there. And they raised some interesting points. I just kind of wanted to run by you guys, get the conversation going here a little bit. Uh, CCTV at a hotel. What exactly does that mean? How much CCTV is there going to be at a Marriott like that? Common areas obviously will be covered. Uh, you might have them in the hallways. You're not going to have them in private areas. So you're not going to have them in the actual rooms. You're not going to have them in restrooms or even the public restrooms. If there's a pool and there's showers at the pool, you're not going to have them there. So there's going to be certain areas on that premises that are effectively blacked out from CCTV coverage. That being said, this is a Marriott attached to an airport. I think 
they might have a little bit higher security than just a general hotel. And outside of that, if she did, let's say she met someone, brought someone back to her room, something along those lines, there's a really good chance that CCTV is going to pick up that motion somewhere. The two of them walking together or even someone going to her door. What if, you know, what if it's a delivery man or, or something along those lines? Um, I think you're going to have enough CCTV in that type of location where you're going to be able to stitch that together. Are they working at that angle? I'm sure. I'm sure that they're looking at all the CCTV they can to try to rule those things out or possibly trace anyone that they're unsure of. Like, hey, who's this person? Why did they go up to her floor on that particular day? We don't see them you know, going to any particular room. Um, I think they're probably looking into that and working on that. Uh, another conversation that comes up is about the do not disturb sign. Would that help be responsible for why they didn't find this for two days? I looked into this a bit more and the conversation that I've found is basically all supporting. No, no, there's nothing about those do not disturb signs. As a matter of fact, in a lot of recent trips that I've taken, when I go stay at a hotel, um, I'm finding signage in my room now that's basically saying, Hey, you can put up the do not disturb sign, but we are going to come in at least once a day. Uh, you know, we're doing it as a security measure. We're doing it for this reason. We're doing it for that reason. Um, so there are some people out there that are adamant. They're like, no, a do not disturb sign means that they cannot come in. As far as I know, that is certainly not true. Definitely not going to be true two days after the person's supposed to be out of the room. So I don't think that that was a factor in the delay, which then raises the question, how does this happen? How do you, how does a hotel, a chain like Marriott, which I'm sure is running on great computer systems, they're not going to have some room that just gets left behind. Like, oh no, we we forgot to send a cleaning person there. Oh, we didn't rent that room out for two days. I would bet there's some report that kicks out daily about the rooms that need to be serviced. Um, probably some form of automation that even sends that into some person's queue about, hey, you know, check, let us know when these have been serviced so we can get these back on the rental board. Um, so it's it's a really bizarre question. What is going on with that time gap? And I, I can say that that does make it somewhat reasonable that at least the possibility of it being someone related to the hotel in some way, possibly uh, being someone that works there or knows about the systems there in some way. Maybe they don't work there, but they just know enough about how to get around there, around those systems, might be involved in this. Um, Around that conversation, some people were asking, did Diana possibly get an extension on the room? Did she go there for the one initial night, call down to the desk and say, you know what, I'm going to stay for two, two more days, add them to my tab? Probably not because like I mentioned before, I am almost certain that that room would have been lined up by American Airlines. Um, would she be able to extend the room on their tab? Probably not. But I can tell you, I've been in situations where I've had rooms that were covered for me and I've wanted to extend the stay on them. And it it's usually not an issue for me to call down and say, hey, I'm staying for an extra day or two, um, but we need to close off their tab and start a new one, but I don't want to change rooms. Is that possible? I've I've never had a problem with that. That is, has always happened. So is there a possibility that she actually did extend the room herself? I think think so. It's, I just don't think it would have been extended on the original reservation. She might have called down and said, I need two more days. Here's my credit card number. Is this foul play? We just don't know. There's not enough to know. We've got a couple of indicators. The homicide department indicator is pretty strong. Uh, the indicator that the family has not been able to have a funeral service yet or even talk about timing for a memorial service. I think that's pointing in that direction as well. Um, I, I really don't know when we hear something on this case. I think if there was obvious signs of trauma, I would like to think that they would have at least released some form of that knowledge publicly so that the, the us, so that the people could actually help with this case in some way. Like if there was something in terms of um, you know, I was at the airport that day. I saw some guy that was running out. He had a scratch mark on his face, you know, some, something along those lines. If, if there were signs of violence in that room, I think the message about violence would have been released in some controlled manner at this point. 
because remember we're already two weeks out so we've already got memories starting to age like you know me remembering what i did two months ago a lot different compared to me remembering what i did two weeks ago and that's very different compared to me remembering what i did two days ago um so i don't know on the foul play situation uh, you know, there's people asking, is it a crew member? Is it possible that someone on the crew is responsible for this? And that's why, you know, like no one really went back to check on her. I don't know. It, it's that's just one of the avenues of conversation that's happening around this case. Did she potentially meet up with someone? Possibility. Was there some type of delivery made? Possibly. Was there someone that, like I said, is familiar with that hotel, knows how to work around it, get around the ins and outs of it? Maybe. And that doesn't necessarily have to be an employee, but I can tell you also being discussed in this area is the possibility of an employee. But around all that, and considering the examples that I found when it came to a sock being found in someone's mouth, I don't think we can avoid the possibility of some attempt at self-harm. And over at AFSP, which is the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, um, this is the 11th leading cause in the U.S. of death. In 2021, over 48,000 lives were lost. On average, there are 132 lives lost each day, people that are taking their own lives. White males account for nearly 70% of that. However, a stat that maybe has a, a light of hope in it, 94% of adults surveyed in the U.S. think that it can be prevented. And if you are struggling with thoughts of this kind at all, if you're here in the U.S., it's very easy. You just have to dial 988. That's it from anywhere in the U.S. And talk to someone. Please get some help. So Diana... Uh, was brought back to Houston. We learned that through the GoFundMe as well. And you can see American Airlines rolled out all their employees here for the arrival of her body. They did the water salute, which I'm not sure if you've ever seen, but gives me chills anytime I see it. It's essentially where they have the water cannons that are shooting up over the runway as the plane comes in. Uh, she was also greeted by ground crews and air crews to pay their respects and present her with roses. Um, we've got a few different photos here of the crews down there as they are getting ready to unload her. And uh, there's an actual shot of them unloading Diana. So there is a GoFundMe. This is to benefit the family in this trying time. Of course, they've got a memorial that they're going to have to pay for with this. On behalf of myself and my amazing supporters out there, thank you guys so much. We are going to make a donation to this GoFundMe to assist with that. Um, and I just want to say to Diana's family, I'm very sorry that you guys are going through this. And I, I'm trying to turn what is a bad situation here into meaningful conversation that might help other people's lives. If this is a security incident that needs to be figured out, boy, this is going to be the bell to ring that. We've already got people that are really pressing on that front in significant ways here. Uh, if this is an issue of mental health, self-care, boy, we need to ring that bell, guys. It's it's It comes up on this channel very frequently. Uh, it comes up in all of our personal lives very frequently, and it's a conversation that we really, really need to have. So um, anyway, uh, I did find one other thing that was important to Diana, and I wanted to honor her um, for what she was doing in life as well. I found a post on her Facebook page for her birthday back in 2022 and she wanted to do, to do a fundraiser for the American Cancer Society. Uh, she said, for my birthday this year, I'm asking for donations to American Cancer Society. I've chosen this nonprofit because their mission means a lot to me, and I hope you'll consider contributing as a way to celebrate with me. Um, I am actually going to split the donation I usually do, and I'm going to do half into the GoFundMe to help the family with the memorial and expenses. And I'm also going to do a donation into the uh, Cancer Society because I just want to honor what uh, Diana was trying to do 
on her birthday back in 2022. And uh, it kind of bummed me out a little bit when I saw that this needle didn't move above zero and I wanted to change that for Diana. So if you want to support either of those, I'll have links in the description box down below. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate each and every one of you that come here to the channel, that open your eyes and your hearts to these cases. And uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Please join us again next week on the Lord March channel.